Okay, I think uh, colleagues and students, thanks uh, for coming to this uh, School of Science and IS uh, Nobel Prize Popular Science Lecture. And today, I think Professor Michael Lawyer uh, will share with us his knowledge and insight into uh, this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And I'm sure you are amazed by, that, by the fact that uh, Professor Lawyer is a physicist, yet he is going to talk about chemistry today. But we all know that the uh, research nowadays uh, is very interdisciplinary anyway, so you are, if you think about that, you will not be surprised. And Professor Michael Roy received his uh, uh, BSc and PhD degree all from University of uh, Cal California at Berkeley. And uh, after he received his PhD, uh, he uh, worked for more than 20 years uh, at IBM uh, in New York. And he joined the uh, HQST in 1993, and he has been the dean of the science uh, from 1998 to 2004. And uh, he's uh, currently also a affiliate member of the IAS, and he's a fellow of American Physic Physical Society. Uh, Professor Lloyd's uh, main research interest include the nonlinear optical uh, pro propagation effects, uh, nonlinear optical study of surface and surf molecular surface interactions, and ultra fast uh, dynamic induced by femtosecond laser pulse. And recently, I think uh, he uh, showed interest in super-resolution uh, optical microscope for uh, cell imaging. And actually, through uh, his effort, uh, a group of researchers in HKST have been very active in this area of research recently. And very recently, this group of researchers have been awarded a major research funding of around eight million Hong Kong dollars under the Collaborative uh, Research Funding, CRF scheme to carry out the research in super resolution imaging. And uh, so I will make my introduction short, uh, pass my stage to uh, Professor Lawyer, and please uh, join me to uh, welcome Professor Michael Lawyer to, for his uh, talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for coming uh, with this kind of weather. I was wondering whether anybody will show up. <laughs> so, uh, okay, but uh, firstly, I have to say that uh, I think nothing that I say today could be classified as chemistry. Okay, so don't let that confuse you. Okay. Uh, I will explain a little bit why, uh, <coughs> why is the Nobel Prize in chemistry the best I can. Um, <clears throat> secondly, uh, I, uh, I don't know a whole lot about uh, biology. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about optics either, but I'll do my best to tell you uh, what I know about this area. <clears throat> uh, firstly, uh, two slides of uh, advertising local work. Uh, we have a, um, hmm, well, So we do have a super resolution center here, and we have a super resolution microscope here, and thanks to the work of uh, these two students, hardworking students. Uh, and more importantly, this has been used. Uh, we designed it so that uh, it could be used in principle by anyone, okay, with a little bit of training. And uh, just to show that, in fact, this is the case, here are some images from uh, Ai Fang, from Professor Harrop's student, and also from Yuan Liang, uh, a research assistant professor. Neither of them are physicists. Okay. So uh, they can take these pictures. And uh, if you want to know what super resolution is about, you can see here. Normally, you only see this. That's the best you can do. Super resolution, you can see this. Okay. So you can resolve these things. OK. But today we are to talk about these three gentlemen. Uh, Eric Bessick, Stephen Hell, and 
W. E. Murner. He he does not he is not known as William. He is known as W. E. Okay. He was my colleague at IBM, so I know most about him. But I actually I will tell you most about him. But I'll give you enough time for the other two as well. So they are awarded for the development of super resolution fluorescent microscopy. So the plan of the talk is what exactly is this and why is it important? And I will tell you something about who they are, what did they do? And I know because Professor Big Tai gave me this charge asking me to explain why them and not anybody else. Okay. Uh, I do not know what I can do a good job, but I'll try my best. Why chemistry prize? Now that is hard. So I quote him, who is the chair of the uh, committee. And the uh, reporter asked him, why is it chemistry? So he said, well, it can look at single molecules. Uh, this is true. And then he said, it is really a prize that goes into all the prize areas, has great potential in medicine. It has a lot to do with physics. Okay. And a lot to do with chemistry. Actually, he lied. <laughs> for this price, it has a lot to do with physics, for sure. But the part that to do with chemistry uh, was not really uh, uh, recognized by, by, by this. And he said, this is one of these prizes that eradicate the borders between the subjects. OK, so don't ask that question anymore. OK, it eradicate the border between these things. And uh, you can listen to him if you want. OK, first, Eric Bessick. He said, chemistry was always my weakest subject through high school and college. <laughs> now, he got his degree in uh, applied and engineering physics from Cornell. And his thesis topic was near field scanning optical microscopy, or ENSOM. I'll talk a little bit about it. And then he said, this is interesting, he said, train as a physicist. Now, this is only for the physicists among us. He said, when I was a young man, I would look down on chemists. Okay. <laughs> and then as I started to get into the super resolution, which is really all about the probes, I came to realize it was my karma because instead I was on my knees begging the chemist to come up with better probes, which is true. <laughs> okay. and, and I have been on my knees as well, asking them. OK, and uh, so he said, but it's poetic justice, and I'm happy to get it wherever it is, because I would be embarrassed to call myself a chemist. He's very honest. Now him, he is interesting. He is actually a Romanian. Uh, he got his degree again in physics in 1990, and he has this idea. And then he went to Finland for three years because he figured that nobody in Germany would allow him to do what he wanted to do. Okay. At least that's what he says. Okay. Finally, my friend, W. E. Murner, uh, he, is, he is actually the department he head of chemistry in Stanford. But he has no degree in chemistry either. Okay. In fact, he has degrees in physics, EE, mathematics, but not chemistry. And yet he is department head of chemistry. Okay. He, he again got his degree in physics uh, from Cornell. Cornell should be uh, celebrating this. Everybody is connected with this. In fact, more. They, are, they all come from Cornell. And he said he felt incredibly fortunate and happy, so on and so forth. OK, so firstly, it is for the development of, the, of, of this technique. It is not for making it uh, popular or useful. OK, so it is for development. That's very important. And I will tell you that actually the physics of linear and nonlinear optics uh, play a big role in here. And I think we'll continue to. 
But you might wonder that microscopy is such an old subject and optics is such an old subject that how can a Nobel Prize be awarded for optics in the 21st century? Of course, obviously, it is important. Okay. So I, uh, I thought, and then I went and figured out that the oldest optics book was actually written by Euclid in 300 BC. And you go and look at this, and you can find it. He says, very interesting, he said, nothing you see simultaneously are seen in total. He said, what in the world is he talking about? Okay. Now, firstly, I have to show you that I got it right, right? Nothing that is seen is seen at once in its entirety. This is a transcendent. Of course, I, I got it from here. Okay, but now he said that the reason he said that he said because you see something, it depends how close you see it. The closer you see it, the more clear it is. Okay, and therefore you never see totally everything. Okay, when you get closer, you see better. And now you see what well, that's. That's okay. But then, you know, he, he's okay. He's not just a mathematician. The next one, I was really surprised. He said, well, rectangular objects, when seen from a distance, appear round. Now, that says that if you don't have enough resolution, you cannot believe what you see. Okay? Rectangular object can become round. So he actually was already worrying about resolution. Now fast forward to Robert Hooke, who's a physicist, and he looks like this. I tried to get a better picture, but that's what he looks like. Okay. <laughs> now he went through this, he invented this with a double, with the eyepiece and the objective and he's using an oil lamp to light it up to see. So maybe that's why he looked like this, <laughs> because he looked at that too, too, too much. But he was looking at cork, and he called this cell. And that word cell now became the word, of course, it's not the biological cell, but that word cell is the first time used by him. But uh, now this is a physicist's way of saying that he is the father of microscopy. Uh, biologists or life scientists would say that it is this guy, Anton Leeuwenhoek. Now he is not even a scientist. He is a cloth merchant. And you know cloth merchant, you know, depending on your shirt, if you buy a shirt with many very fine threads, you could charge a lot more than if you have cores, right? So he needs to know the number of thread counts. So he figured out that he can use an, an objective to see it. And then he said, now he, you know, he, he looks very much more relaxed. I guess, his, his, or he has a better painter. That's the other way. He paid more money to, for the painter, maybe. But he's an interesting guy. He said, most go to make money out of science or get a reputation. But in lens grinding and discovering things hidden from our sight, those count for naught. And he said, most men are not curious to know. He says, some even make no bone of our saying, what does it matter whether we know it or not? I hope none of you are like that, otherwise you won't come up here in the middle of the day in the rain. So we are more like him. Now he invented this, which is pretty amazing. He said, this is a microscope. It took me a long time to figure out how can this be a microscope. I thought this was a door handle, right? It doesn't look like a door <laughs> handle. Well, you look closely. He figured out that uh, you know, uh, Robert Hooke, all this stuff. Really, what is doing the work is this thing here. Okay, all this thing is doing is helping, helping your eyes look a little bit easier. So he said, I don't need any of this stuff. Just, just use that. So he put this into this hole, blow it up for you. He put the sample onto this tip, and then he can adjust the distance here, and he look. Pretty amazing. I've always learned that life scientists, they work very hard. And uh, they, they do incredible things. Uh, 
like this. Now, amazingly, he can draw these beautiful pictures. He saw the red blood cell, 1719, and all that. Okay. Okay. Now, then people say, "Well, can you can you see better and better?" Uh, this man, uh, Abby, he he worked at SAIS, and he published in 1873 this formula. Okay. In life science, this is called the Abby limit. Now, physicists, uh, I guess, they want to do it for themselves. So actually, Lord Rayleigh, almost 20 years later, yeah, more than, more, more than 20 years later, no, 13 years, yeah, 20, 23 years later, published a paper, and he confirmed this formula. Now, and then he said, well, actually, it's Lagrange. <coughs> Lagrange did it. So one French, one German, one British, they all said this is the limit. And what does this limit mean? Well, this limit is pretty restrictive. Basically says you cannot do better than 200 nanometer. Okay, if you use 400 nanometer light, blue light, the best you can do is about 200 nanometer. Now, it, this means it doesn't matter how big you blow it up, right? You see, I can blow it up you say, well, this distance here, like this, right? many, many centimeters. But it doesn't matter. You still cannot resolve the two. So it is not magnification that counts. It is resolution that counts. So 200 nanometer, no matter what you do. Abby said that. Lagrange said that. Lord Rayleigh said it. Now, you can do electron microscopy. That would be much, much better. But electron microscopy is not on living things. It is on things that you cut it up, freeze it, put it in a vacuum. So here is the picture. Naked eye, you can see about 10 to the minus 4 meter. Okay. With optical microscopy, this is a function of years. This is invention. And then it basically stops here. Okay. Electron microscopy, yes, indeed, it can do much better. And the scanning probe can do much better. What this price this year recognized is this. It jumped by, you can see, 10 times better doing what this guy did. Now, you might say, how about these? Now, none of those has the potential to look at living things. This has a potential to look at living things. Now, I still would say factor of 10. Now, for physicists, we never look at factor of 10. We look at, you know, look for 100,000, 10,000 better. Right? Only factor of 10. But you have to recognize that uh, this factor of 10 is very, very important for life science. Okay. And that is because life science, biology, they have a natural scale. The natural scale is like this. Now, this is the Abbey limit. So basically, you cannot see inside the cell if you cannot see these things. So if you don't see this, uh, then all these beautiful pictures that you see in the biology textbook, they, they, it's it's in the head. They trim it up using electron microscopy. Okay. And then they trim up a story. And this is like you get a stack of picture, and you write up the history. It's a little bit hard. It would be much better if you can actually see these things. Now, worse, you know that the function of Biology is the central dogma that DNA makes RNA, makes protein. And it's a protein that is the workhorse. It's the protein that is making you function. So if you cannot see the protein, then it's a little bit of a problem. So therefore, 
people always want to say, okay, we want to see proteins, we want to see these functional units, and we want to see these in action in these structures. And that's why everybody wants to know how can we visualize object in a size range 10 to 20 nanometer. Okay, now I have to tell you a little bit about microscopy. Firstly, what actually do you see in, my, in, in microscopy? You say, well, the sample, right? Well, okay, so here, let me try to see what I, I have learned how to do this. I, now I've learned how to do this. Now here, do you see anything? You cannot see anything? I have something here. Okay. So what you see, only thing you can see is actually contrast, unique contrast. Now, biologists know all about that. I'll tell you the history. But let me just show you. So even if you go to sleep the next few minutes, you know what I'm talking about. So actually what you see is contrast. So this is contrast. You can see it, right? You can see this black thing on white. This is equivalent to what biologists did since 1850, which is staining. Okay, staining, they put some stain on it. So if I put a white piece of thing here, you still see it, but this is much better. Okay. Then the physicists figure out much better if you use fluorescence. Fluorescence means you absorb certain light and you emit that light in another frequency. So here it is. For comparison, I have the black thing. Now I put this thing here. Much brighter. Okay, you see this much better. And you can use another color. Okay, then you can see a lot of things. So this is all you need to understand to understand the rest of the talk. This is the basis of fluorescent microscopy. Okay. Stain is required to see it, but if I can put fluorescence on something, I can label different things and I can differentiate them. Okay. So I will go through the next few very quickly because basically I have covered So, so basically what you need is contrast and stain is what you need and that's why Golgi got a Nobel Prize because he figured out how to stain, remember this, before you see nothing, now you can see this. Well, a physicist They're always ahead of the time, but that's okay. He said, if this is good, then fluorescence is better. Okay. So this guy, Oscar Heimstedt, he did the first fluorescent microscopy. This here, this is a picture. He reported in 1911. At the end, he said, if and to what degree fluorescent micro microscopy will widen the possibility of microscope imaging, only the future will tell. That's because the thing always breaks down. Okay. So, but that's okay. These problems are all solved. Now today, fluorescent microscopy is the thing that everybody in life science uses. The important part in addition to optics and detectors is the fact that you have fluorescent antibodies. Now these antibodies, for those of you who are not life scientists, they have this remarkable property that 
they can go and find that particular protein that you want to image. This is amazing, right? You have this thing, you've got, you got thousands of protein in this thing. You find this antibody, you attach the dye there, this thing will directly go and find it for you. If, if, if only you can find terrorists that way, that will be very, very easy to kill them. So this is amazing. So now you can have this microscope. And you can attach different color, just like this. OK, different color. And so you can have this. This is Roger Tian's work. So this is something that they use all the time. And uh, in particular, this confocal version. So every life scientist who's looking at things either has a confocal microscope, buying one, or desperately waiting for money to buy another one. Okay. And uh, the reason is that it is a very nice instrument. Uh, but uh, even though that is the case, the resolution is still 200 nanometer. All those money that you spend buying this, still 200 nanometer. Of course, if you don't need to see better, that's fine. Right? So, how can we do better? If you think about it, these people already said this is impossible, right? German, French, British, they are great guys. You don't fool around with them. So basically, it is a limit that you cannot be beat. You cannot beat it. Nothing you can do to beat it. But these three people figure out two ways to go around them. Okay. And one of them is called STAT. The other one is called single molecule. So STAT is him. Single molecule are these two guys. Okay. And I will tell you what it is. What is in the name? Well, it is important. For physicists, we always want to know what is a stat. Okay. It's called stimulated emission depletion. Uh, and single molecule, SMD for its localization, they're called palm, storm, F palm. Important thing to recognize that this requires high intensity. It is a nonlinear process. The reason you can get better resolution comes from the fact that you use a nonlinear process. Therefore, it is not governed by fully transforms linear theory, and that's why you can so-called beat, but you actually go around the uh, diffraction limit. OK. Now, if you say, well, if the confocal is limited by the spot, which is the case, there's another way to make the spot smaller, which is this way. And this is Eric Bessix. It's his first time he appeared. His thesis, he said, well, you just put a hole right next to the sample. And if it's so close, then the, the spot on the sample will be very small, which is true. Uh, we, have an, we have an enzyme. It's hard. It is really hard. And everybody who ever uses it always know that an enzyme is really hard to use. If you try to get 200 nanometer resolution, you have to kill yourself. Okay. He invented it. He published two papers. I'll tell you more about that. And then he went to work for Bell Labs. OK, now back to Stephen Hell. So he got this bright idea, which I call a dark idea. Why is it a dark idea? He said, well, you cannot beat this limit, but you can make the surrounding dark. So, OK. So he said that uh, if I have a very high power donut quenching beam, now what does that mean? It means this.
So you have a beam. So the diffraction or Lagrange auto says, OK, this is smaller you can get. Diffraction. So if you have a feature, it's like this. You can scan all you want. It's not going to resolve it. So he said, I cannot make this small, but I can deplete the edge of the emitter so that when I actually detect it, it's become dark. And if you do it linearly, you can make it a little bit smaller. But if you use very high power, you can actually make it very small. In that case, you can scan it, and you will resolve it. So that's the idea. Now, I can imagine why he has to go to uh, Finland. In Germany, you go and tell your professor to, that I will do this. I think he will kick you out of the door because he said, this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Okay. So, and he knew that. So, he did something that very smart. He went away. He went away. He went, he was originally here, nice warm, near Frankfurt. I think he was in uh, Göttingen, uh, Heidelberg, I think. He went to Taku, okay, in Finland. Now, this is a good place to do research. Why? Look at the temperature. Now it has a temperature high of 1 degree C, low of 3 degree C, and it has a daylight only 6 hours. So you can't do anything outside. You can just spend all your time, and particularly if you do theory, you just go inside a room, give you a piece of paper, you can do it. And that's what he did for three years. And he published two papers. This is to show that, yes, if for linear effect, you have this, it doesn't help you. But for high power, you can get a very sharp edge, get a donut. And he got this. Okay. So, and then he came back. Once he got his paper, he came back to Germany because he needed very high power laser. And he convinced somebody to do it. So here is his video. I want you to see him. Uh, Hope it works. Hope it works. Just imagine that this is how you would see the world, out of focus and blurred with no chance of putting on glasses or getting things into focus some other way. And more light didn't help either. On the contrary, the bright parts dazzle you and make it harder to see the things nearby. Precisely that was the frustrating situation for scientists who wanted to observe molecules in living cells under an optical microscope. They saw anything smaller than 200 nanometers as a blur of light. We're talking about things that are 5,000 times smaller than the tip of this pencil. That's about a 200th of the width of a single hair. At this level, anyone wanting to observe processes in living objects comes up against the limits of resolution. By comparison, if you enlarge a pencil tip, which is about 2 millimeters wide 5,000 times, that is about the size of a cell. Here we are at the gates of the nano world. From here, it's impossible to make out any details. That is what the law formulated by the physicist Ernst Abbe in 1873 tells us. Because light comes in waves, very fine structures can no longer be distinguished under an optical microscope. 
At 200 nanometers, about half the wavelength of light, you reach the limits of resolution. There are lots of molecules like these figures, but if you try to view them under an optical microscope, they become blurred like all objects which are closer to each other than 200 nanometers. Professor Stefan Hell and his team wanted to produce optical microscope images. You can compare the scientists at the same time. When cells are closer together than 200 nanometers, they light up at the same time. And that's why the sample will ultimately appear as a wishy-washy blur. You can compare the scientist's problem with a room in which lots of torches are all shining at the same time very close together. If too much is lit up, all the other pictorial information is outshone. And so under the microscope, the scientists see molecules drifting in a soup of light. They need to find a trick. It's the same with gravity. This thing cannot fly on its own. But if you find the trick of making the rotors turn fast enough, then you know that the helicopter will stay up in the air. You just need to find the trick. The first trick for a sharp nanometer image, switch off some of the fluorescent molecules. It is actually possible not only to make the fluorescent molecules glow, but also to stop them doing so, but unfortunately not one at a time. Then Professor Hell had a brainwave. What if you could use a second beam of light to switch off just the fluorescent glow of the neighboring molecules? It was theoretically possible, but no one had ever tried it before. They needed prototypes of the microscopes. Professor Hell's team experimented with optical components, mirrors and filters. Here you can see them being carefully adjusted. Professor Hell's main focus now lies in switching off the fluorescent molecules in the outer ring of the spot. That is the trick that the scientists have been looking for. Now the scientists are working with two beams of light, a green one to switch them on, so and a red ring-shaped beam to switch them off. Is this the breakthrough? You take a beam that switches on the molecules and makes them glow, but it cannot be focused any more precisely than what I'm showing you here, 200 nanometers. In order to see only the molecules in the middle, you take another beam. It's bagel-shaped, ring-shaped. Now we put them on top of each other, and as you can see, what we have left is just what's in the middle. It's only in the middle, in the hole, that the molecules can light up. Outside, where the bagel is, they've been switched off. And the Okay, so all you have to remember, therefore, is this bagel shape Game. beam. And you got it. Okay. Enough, enough, enough. Enough. Okay, let's continue. So, then he, uh, he published his paper and then and then he got his Nobel Prize, okay, basically. Okay, now I'm going to go to switch to the other one, single molecule. Now that one, the story is more interesting. Involved two people, actually interesting people. Uh, firstly is, can you see one molecule? Well, my colleague, W.E., published a paper while he was in IBM in 1989 that said, yes, indeed, I can see single molecule. Now, this is quite a remarkable thing. And this is from the, from the chemistry uh, Nobel Prize write-up. He said his result was revolutionary. And of course, some people would think that Orit should also get the Nobel Prize. But no, because he uses the same equipment as him. And in fact, he worked in his lab uh, the year before. Anyway, decisive breakthrough was the first detection of single mo uh, 404 carried out by Myrna. OK. Okay. Well, I know him, right? So when, I, when, I announced, when it, this was announced, I said, OK, from my memory, why in the world are you doing single molecule? So I wrote him an email. I said, well, I know, you know congratulations on this. And he, he actually responded immediately. He said that I, my fading memory says that you were working on a hole burning of optical storage. Now, that was the day that 
people in IBM think that you need to increase the density of storage. So you need to, you know, a very crazy idea. Now it is really, today you can have gigabytes of stuff in your pocket, right? Why would they have want to do this anyway? That's, that's the way it is. And he wrote back. He said, in short, we were focusing on this whole burning optical storage, which nobody care anymore. But he was doing something, and he was encouraged to do the most exciting science possible. And he pushed it to the limit. So he, in fact, basically, he detected 5,000, detected 1,000, detected 100. He just pushed it all the way down to one. And he published his paper. And that laid the foundation of his Nobel Prize. Okay. Now, the fact that you can detect single molecule, how, how can that help you? Well, you can do this because if you, can, if you know this, all this light comes from a single molecule, you can identify it at the peak. Now, this is called localization. So you can localize it much better than the size. You can actually work it out. It's the square root of the number of photons. But then the world doesn't, you know, you, th th these things are all overlapping. How can you get non-overlapping? Okay. Now, this is where Eric Bessick had an idea after he quit working for Bell Labs. Now, Eric Bessick is an interesting character, so uh, let me show you what he did. He got his degree in 88. And he immediately got a job at, at the Bell Labs, which is, I tell you, very unusual. But he's a very smart guy. And then by 1994, he turned his back. He quit, I, he quit Bell because uh, whatever reason. Okay? And then he worked for his father for seven years. But in between, he published his paper, Proposed Method for Molecular Optical Image. And then he went to work for his father for seven years. Then he self-employed again, 2005. Then he went to Janela Farm, 2005, published a paper. Then he got his Nobel Prize in 2014. Okay. He deserved it. How to deal with overlapping molecule within the Abbey limb? He wrote this paper. Now look at this. It's a byline of 17 Webster Drive, Berkeley Height, which just looks like this. So he's either self-employed or unemployed, depending on whether you want to be nice to him or not. Okay. Uh, my professor, Ron Shen, said he's unemployed. I said, no, he's self-employed. He is the CEO of this company, which sits there. Now, the idea is very simple. Now, he has a complicated way to explain it, but let me explain it my way, okay? This. Uh, now, basically, he is saying, now you have, uh, you have a bunch of molecules, you have a bunch of emitters overlapping. So this is like something like this. They're all overlapping. Now, do you know what this is? Is it a tree? Is it a man? What is it? Okay. So he said, well, if, if, if somehow you can separate them into different groups so that different groups, you can identify each group so that they would be separated like this, like this, okay. then you can once you separate them one by one, right, then you can localize this, right, because they're separated. Doesn't show up quite quite well, but you, you see you can separate them. Okay. After you separate them, 
you go to the next layer, okay, and then go to another layer. And then at the end, you add them all up. Right? Simple idea, right? And what looks like this? It's actually this. What is this? It's Hong Kong upside down. So we turn it back on, and you see this is Hong Kong right side up. Okay. So this is his idea. That's it. Okay. That is it. And uh, that is his idea. I think a very good idea, actually. So he then, uh, where's my clicker here? So this is idea, become this. But the, but the question at that time was how, how, how do you separate them? Okay. How do you separate them? He couldn't figure it out. So he wrote a paper and he went to work for his father in Michigan. It's a tool company. Quit. Okay, so this is basic. And then, Myrna, W.E., enter the picture again. Now this was important because he published this paper in 1997. He showed that GFP can be blinking on and off. Now I know him, so I went to visit him around that time, to 1997. I just became dean. I wanted to go and visit him, find out whether he had an exchange program. So there I saw him. He was telling me all this thing about a single molecule blinking. I said, W.E., you were doing optical storage, and you want persistent hole burning, the hole burn in there, store there, and you can get it back. How can something blinking be good? He said, oh, this is important, single molecule. But he couldn't explain to me why it was important. He said, here, this is, he gave me this paper, reprint, with his name signed. Unfortunately, when I cleaned up my office two years ago, I threw it out. Okay, at that time, I didn't know anything about single molecule, didn't I? Not, not, no, actually, three years ago, I threw it out. So, thinking now, you will see that up to this point, knowing this, any one of you could have figured out how to do super resolution. There's no new thing in law needed. You need things to be able to blink it on and off. You need things to be able to localize, and then you add them all up, that's it. Okay? But amazingly, science is a way of going around. The next thing happened was that 1997, then this paper just had to wait until 2002, a photo activable, which is uh, Jennifer Schwartz, they published. And then Bessick and his former Bell Lab colleague, Hess, learned about it in 2005. And then they were both self-employed at that time, in quote, and they did it. And let <coughs> me show you this let them talk, tell to you how this works. And joined him in the semiconductor physics research department. I went to Bell to continue my work from my graduate thesis so, so on the development of the first super resolution optical microscope called the near-field optical microscope. With that microscope, you were able to, for example, on fixed cells, go from resolution like this in the conventional sense to what you see here in the near-field sense. But probably what's most germane for uh, this talk is with the microscope, I was also able to see for the first time single molecules under ambient conditions and make extended observations and imaging of these molecules um, with a uh, resolution down, or not a resolution, but a localization precision down to about 12 nanometers. 
Yeah, meanwhile, at, I was also at Bell Labs, and I was focusing on scan probe microscopy, but particularly at low temperatures. And this was an exciting field at the time. I was trying a few different variations of scan probe microscopes to sense tunneling current, magnetic field, or electrical field, and actually had a lot of fun with that. But sooner or later, uh, Eric and I decided to join forces, and uh, we combined his near field technology, which sort of uh, puts light in a very small diffractive area, uh, together with my low temperature uh, system. And we focused initially on a system called quantum wells, which where you have these little luminescent centers which are supposed to glow. Another way to uh, represent that data okay, you is with picture. this little block that you see right here. At that time, uh, they're doing where different you see X and Y down here, which is real space. And the vertical scale up here is now spectral. Now, so you can see that the uh, spreading the data out in, spec in the spectral dimension really helps us to see these individual luminescent centers and was key to this uh, particular experiment. Okay, so while I had a lot of fun uh, with Harold and uh, doing my other experiments with near, with near Field while I was at Bell, uh, eventually I got pretty uh, fed up with the whole thing, in part because of the physical limitations of the Near Field technique, and in part because it engendered a really big academic bandwagon. So he said, how hard it is to do hands-on. So he then he said he would do something else. So he published this paper, which I'll talk to you about. Now, because of time, let me fast forward to here. So this now they, they are both self-employed. And uh, they were doing a bunch of things. They do some hiking together. And, uh, and then they heard about. Uh, in 2003, I first read a paper about green fluorescent protein, uh, which, of course, has since, even by that time, was in the process of completely transforming cell biology and many other fields yeah, of every biology. Every biologist knew about that um, by then. And honest to goodness, I was probably the last man on Earth to learn about GFP, but I immediately realized that this would be transformative not only to biology, but to biological microscopy because of what we might be able to do with it. So in my job searching, I had also contacted a lot of other friends. And one of the places uh, which I visited was Tallahassee, Florida. And there, uh, I thought it might be an interesting place to see whether Eric's idea could possibly fly. So they both went there. And particularly at that place, there's a, a laboratory called the Magnet Laboratory, uh, where we had networking colleagues. And one person there, Michael Davidson, uh, was remarkable. He actually has a, a wonderful website, uh, very comprehensive, and was writing you know, very important uh, reviews of all the major developments in, in the field. In particular, uh, while we are there, he pointed out there's not just the green fluorescent protein. There are a whole new class of optical highlighters, or photoactivatable PAFPs. Those proteins, fluorescent proteins, are essentially dark, or maybe off in a different spectral range. And when you uh, normally look at it, you see nothing. But if you shine blue light, you can effectively turn them on. And this was magical. So um, as soon as Harold and I uh, left Tallahassee, it became obvious to us that this was really the missing link to make that idea that I had published after I first left Bell work. So um, the thought is, is rather than bathing the entire specimen with blue light until it all glows, is just turn on the, the blue or purple light for a very brief period of time so only a few molecules turn on at once. Then since they're isolated from one another, we can find their centers and plot those. Then they burn out and bleach, and we turn on a new set of molecules by pulsing the light on again, and repeat this process for many frames until you determine the coordinates of every molecule inside of the boat. Once we realized that this was uh, possible, we immediately set off to a quiet so place, a Sedona, Arizona, and wrote up our ideas in a patent and started scheming we'll how can we make this microscope happen fast. It was an idea which was very right next. and potentially very powerful at the time. See what they do next. And uh, they built so one within about a month or two, we were actually out in my living room assembling, collecting parts room. and assembling the microscope itself. We were able to sort of bypass the complete funding uh, procedure or venture capital and we were able to move at lightning speed. So within literally a few months, 
the summer of 2005, you, this was existing in the living room. But the one missing piece still was, uh, as physicists, we didn't know the first thing about how to do real biology, so we need to collaborate with good biologists. So uh, I had been set to uh, give an interview talk at NIH uh, about the... Okay, so then they, they, they got this thing, and then they did it in Janela Farm. Okay. Uh, it's remarkable that Janela Farm recognized this and give them a job. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I want to at least, uh, okay. So, so they, they did it in Janana Farm, and this is what they got the Nobel Prize. Okay. All right. Now to answer Vic's question. Now it's somehow very strange because this idea has been around certainly to, you can say, 1999. You can say 2002, but all of a sudden in 2006, three groups simultaneously, or close to simultaneously, wrote a paper. First one, of course, is them. Submitted in 13 of March 2006 because they had everything done in the living room. They just moved it to Janela Farm, got a sample and do it. Accepted 2nd of August, published on 9, 10 of August. Appear in print 15 of September. All this data are important. Xiao Wei Zhang submitted 7 of July, accepted 31st of July, published on 9, 9 August 2006, one day before 10 August 2006. However, there's a third group, that person also named Hess, Samuel T. Hess. As I checked today, he's still an associate professor of physics. He submitted June 12th, earlier than Xiao Wei. So of the three, Zhang Xiao Wei submitted last, but appeared on, online one day before. Uh, so they have all done it, all within time. But I think it is pretty clear that they did it first. So, of course, I think Zhang Xiaowei uh, would feel bad, but I think she is so smart that she'll probably get a Nobel Prize some other way. Uh, and she's young. Actually, I think the person that probably feel the worst is him. Okay. Uh, because you're talking about developing a, a microscope, and he has uh, quite a bit to do with it. And after all, the first one was built in his living room. Okay. But anyway, so it be it. But let me finish the story firstly by showing you this, and then showing a little bit more. Weeks after the Nobel Prize was announced, I saw this. It's Washington Post said, Eric Bessick has just revolutionized microscopy again. That's because he published this paper, and this paper is absolutely remarkable, and it really will change microsc uh, uh, microscopy, re revolution microscopy. So if you look at his thing, Eric Bessick did something remarkable. Every time he quit his job, he wrote an important paper. Okay, here he quit his job, published this paper, and then he was thinking about coming back, read what he was doing. He said, he become restless, he wanted to return to sign, but he has no publication in the last 10 years. Big gap on my resume. So I knew I had to come up with some intellectual capital. So he was thinking, trying hard, and then he wrote this paper. But of course, this is not what got him to the Nobel Prize, because in the meantime, this other thing came, and then so this earlier paper led to this paper, this paper led to the Nobel Prize. 
But in the meantime, this thing bear fruit, and he published this. So there is really life after Nobel Prize. Uh, I think I would like to just end the talk by uh, showing you the conclusion of, uh, of, of, of the earlier video. Now remember, this is uh, before he got his Nobel Prize. This is done in 2011. Okay. So here it is, I'm talking about this. And particularly, it's because there are so many young people here. It's one. very helpful for us in, in succeeding. I think both of us have a, a, a little bit of a aversion for doing um, the mainstream. And so we actively sought out areas uh, which were not very fashionable at all, very valuable to seek out a diversity of experiences. We sort of bounced through new problem sets from the outside, not just from the immediate research, but from the outside. I think was very helpful and actually very, very liberating for us and made the whole thing a lot of fun. Yeah, and just to reiterate what Harold just said, I, I think one of the key lessons is to not necessarily jump on those bandwagons, like I said, but forge your own path, okay? Um, it, most people who are probably looking at this video have been in science for a while, and if you're a young guy, you're trying to figure out how you're gonna, what you're gonna really do for your career. You've probably invested a lot of time and effort to get to this point. I think it's a, mis a mistake too many people make to try to go the safe route from a funding perspective and whatever to go into the fields that are already fairly mature. Um, the thing to do is to really try, in my opinion, to strike your own path. But you have to really have the courage of your convictions to tune out what other people are saying and to n not be upset when you don't get the first grant or two. And, and to try to be a little bit scared because the adrenaline pump also helps in being... Now listen, he said you had to be a little bit scared because he was scared about his resume. That's why he wrote those paper on letters like sheet. Okay. He, he, I'm sure he tried very hard. Productive. Continue. But really, whatever you do, you should do the thing that you love doing because nothing worthwhile was ever done without passion. Okay, so this is what I think all the young people you should remember. If you don't like what you do, you're not going to do a good job. And nothing, he said, nothing, nothing worthwhile was ever done without passion. Okay. So, and here is somebody full of passion, got his Nobel Prize, he still published paper. He might even quit his job again. Because I heard from my professor, he, Bessick's wife is my professor's student. Okay. Bessick said, I don't care about my job, I'll go wherever my wife goes. But after he got the Nobel Prize, I guess that situation might, I, I don't think he need to worry about that. But uh, he loves his work, he has passion, and that's why he's successful. So I think I better stop here. I already talked for one hour. Thank you. So anybody have any questions? Yeah, pick. Okay, I think, uh, okay. Let, let me uh, say a few words, I think, uh, before the question. I think we need to thank uh, Michael, as you can see, he's been a, a great effort to try to uh, conduct in all those uh, the transparencies and PPT, you will see that. And I'm sure you agree with me, and Michael is an excellent speaker. He tried to make a very, very complicated thing and into a very, very simple one. And then I'm sure uh, through the story he told us, I'm sure everyone is inspired. Okay, so next questions. 
can you compare Palm Storm and Stead, the advantages and uh, virtues of each? How they compare? Uh, well, with, Stead, you mean Palm and Stead? Over. Palm and Stead. Okay, so uh, Stead is basically, uh, you require high intensity and the resolution will never be better than the 100 nanometer. And the high intensity will kill the sample very quickly. But it has the capability to do fast imaging. Okay. Storm does the work by taking thousands or 10,000 pictures. So it will always be 10,000 times slower. That is the disadvantage of, of Storm. So what about Palm and Storm? Palm and Storm are the same thing. Really the same thing. Same thing. Uh, anything. How they act. It's just a different mechanism of switching. So they all had different ways to make the thing switch. But right now, the easiest thing to do is you pick the die, and they spontaneously switch. And in our system, we pick two dies. We know the magic potion that we put in there, and it switch properly. And uh, they have been taking nice pictures. We don't without doing anything. It seems like palm would be easier. Photoactive, photo, yeah. you mean? No, because palm required that you, you, you shine light, right? You, you, have, you have complication sequence of things. Here, you don't have to do anything. This thing just go up, up and down, and then you just do it all by itself. If you get the chemistry right, this is when I, the chemist help. Are all fluorescent dyes switchable? Uh, not all of them are switchable, but uh, the chemists are very good at this. Uh, they can make anything happen if you, you know, kneel down and back them. Okay. <laughs> uh, they can make dyes that are that. Uh, see, basically, switchable dyes are just basically somewhat unstable. There has to be an unstable point that they can do it. Uh, and, and people now understand that process very well. It's basically oxi oxidation, the ox uh, uh, oxidation, and, uh, and, 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 and process. So uh, they, they can make it uh, if, if they're nice, and you have to back them. So, but that field is unfortunately very well developed. And uh, so uh, it's a, uh, for academic to do it, it it's, it's a little bit difficult because, yeah. Because you make a good die, you make a lot of money. Okay. Any other questions on experiment or mm -hmm. one more onions? Well, I have to ask. So, how small a feature can is it possible to resolve? What's the theoretical limit now for these types of microscopy? I think, I think the, uh, the limit, the 20 nanometer is a practical limit, okay? You can probably go to five or 10, but basically then you have to stabilize everything so that uh, uh, the thing remain the same place while you're taking the thousands of pictures for storm. Um, so that's, uh, that's, going to be, that's going to be difficult. Um, and, and the reason I think this struck the um, lattice light sheet uh, will, will be the important one is that that one probably has the best combination of, of, of ability. You can do a lot of things. But for resolution, I think STORM will be the technique. Chemist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I wonder whether people have tried uh, combined the step and pump, for example, you use a stimulated uh, emission, 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 right? But you just use a photo activated molecule, so you, do, you just use linear spectroscopy, right? Well, you no, if you, you do, actually, right? if you do, if you do linear spectros uh, spectroscopy, even for the switchable, uh, switchable, uh, die, you still would not get a uh, super resolution. But yes, that idea has been, has been done donut, again by... What do you mean is the donut user? The, the donut using a switchable, using a switchable die. Well, Stefan Held did it already. 
and uh, 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 but uh, it still requires high power. It still requires high power because you need you need to re re make it dark so dark that that the hole is small. So you need high power, but not as high as the gigawatt, okay, but still much much higher. So so what, yeah. Yeah, it's high. And one of the problem with this with the stat is that it will not be biologically viable. Okay. I think they, 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 the cell would they don't they don't you know, nothing like to be hit by gigawatt per centimeter square. Okay, so I think uh, I'm really impressed uh, by such a big audience uh, under such a uh, kind of water, and uh, I'm sure you enjoy the talk. And then please uh, join me to thank uh, Michael Loy for his effort and the nice talk. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. My pleasure.